Hi, and this is such a fascinating panel. We've got on this stage three of the people who are running AI-enabled businesses, which are absolutely on the cutting edge with driverless cars, Alex, public service reform, John, and cybersecurity, Poppy. So I just want to start by asking each of you what whether you're worried that there's been too much focus on the threats of AI and what you think the opportunities are and the potential and what we need to do to capitalise on that. Alex, I'm going to start with you. Hey, everyone. Uh, I think on the balance, I'm pleased to see there's a lot of discussion about the risks and how to uh, regulate it responsibly. But I think the scale's tipped a little bit too far that way for me. Uh, I think the opportunity it brings in particular, you know, we've heard a lot about how it's going to be transformational in the ability to manipulate and deal with information with many of the examples just brought up. But also for us in the embodied AI space, uh, I think you know, in the 2030s when we think about AI, it won't just be chatbots chat bots and co-pilots, but it'll be the, robo the robotics, the autonomous vehicles, the embodied systems that allow us to do so much more with our lives. And I think the opportunity that brings, and in particular, who's going to build it, where, how it's going to be built, um, for me, that, uh, that deserves a lot more airtime because it is the biggest transformation that I think we're going to see in this generation. It's very interesting. John? Um, I think similarly, um, if, if what we're seeing in AI today is the pathway to AGI, so that's um, artificial general intelligence or, or AI that is basically human-level intelligence across um, a wide set of tasks, then it's a very big deal, and it's very right that we think carefully about um, whether we even want that to happen and, and sort of how we uh, sort of regulate that as a society. But all AI up till that point is just software, and it's very powerful software that can be used for, um, for good or for bad, but where the focus really should be on figuring out the ways to implement it um, to, for good um, right across the economy because the, the potential for, for change is absolutely huge. And actually sort of reflecting on some of the conversations that we've uh, heard this afternoon, it's extremely clear the technology is powerful. I think we, we almost don't need to debate that any further. It, the, the thing that's coming up for me is, is adoption as the big gap. Um, the, if the sort of economy in, in general, the public sector in particular, was just able to take today's technology, if you just froze technology progress and you sort of treated that as the frontier, the distance between where we stand today and that frontier is already huge. And really our energy should be focused on um, how we drive adoption to, to sort of bring forward the benefits that that would, that that would yield. Poppy, what's your overview? I think we sort of sometimes fall into the trap about thinking that AI is everything that's about to happen. And we forget that actually today we're using AI all the time, whether it's sort of translating tools or mapping tools. But in our mind, it's this futuristic, looming thing that's something to be fearful of. Many of us have like huge opportunities and benefits every day by using AI, and we're not scared of that, but we are apprehensive about what the future holds and how we balance that off. I'm in the business of cybersecurity, so I see right at the sharp end of where it is being used for bad and how people can sort of leverage these technologies for their own sort of personal financial advantage. And even seeing everything that I do, I am incredibly excited about the sort of future side of artificial intelligence. But the reality is, like, the cat's out the bag. Like, this is happening, and we need to think about how we make the most of this opportunity and do so safely, because if not, it will be done to us. And from your point of view, is the greatest threat sort of criminal gangs or rogue states? What's the, or, or something completely different? And, and if, depending on the answer to that, what do we need to do in terms of regulation? It's always what you, the opposite of what you predict. Because naturally, you'll be thinking, goodness me, it could be nation state, and how do I make sure that my organization is protected about that? And you might put some infrastructure to protect against it. And then something that you've never predicted is the thing that you always fall down on. So for example, when we started Dark Trace, a decade ago, I th was constantly thinking, okay, well, there's bad guys there that are outside of your organization. How do I protect this from the business? Never in a million years did I predict that the employees of that organization would knowingly upload vast quantities of their own corporate data willingly into a third party open source AI platform. That wasn't something that I forecasted, but yet that does happen. So it's not really about trying to wholly predict the risk, it's about how do you build resilience when that risk isn't always foreseeable. So Alex, what do you think that means in terms of what the government needs to do? So Rishi Sunak's talked a lot about having an AI summit, wanting to be the world leader on this. 
uh, where do you think the government and countries around the world need to go in terms of putting guardrails, as they've been described this morning? As I described, I think this is a huge opportunity, and first and foremost, we need to be able to take the opportunity. Um, we've seen a lot of headwinds when it comes to, to, to developing, uh, say, for autonomous driving, for our, our, our technology, whether it's uh, uncertain regulation, you know, we need a law change to make this possible, and the government uh, has announced that they want to do it, then pulled it back, then gone back and forth, and so that creates it really hard to have the confidence to, to invest in this technology here. So getting certainty of self-driving legislation brought into the fourth session uh, is a really key one. And then it comes to how do, you, how do you actually go and build and create the transformative impacts it needs. And I think there, it really, uh, the major factor is it comes down to compute. Um, we've partnered with Microsoft to be able to get access to world-class levels of compute infrastructure to train the, the, the billion parameter foundation models that, that, that make uh, our approach to autonomous driving work. Um, but you know, we've had to look to, to, to a US technology giant for that. And if you look around the world, you see the appetite for investment in the US where um, venture capitalists are willing to put billions of dollars into ventures to create the compute infrastructure and, and, and the capital that makes training these systems possible. If you look at all the companies building these large, large language models and foundation models, why are there none in Britain? Why are they all in the US or France, for example, or, or China? Um, or then secondly, you know, what is the role of sovereign compute clusters? You know, we've seen Compute Canada, uh, we've seen similar initiatives uh, come out of some other countries. How can we ensure that there's a compute platform um, that can enable this technology to be built here? I think there's a big opportunity uh, for that for government. And in terms of the public, is there a danger that people's assessment or analysis of risk changes with new things? So it'll only take one driverless car knocking over an old lady and public will turn against them potentially, whereas actually old ladies are knocked down every day by driver, dri driven cars. How do you sort of manage that? It's, it's interesting. I mean, I think we're all not old enough to, to remember this, but when elevators came out, you used to have, you know, there were these scary machines that would move you between floors, but you used to have people that would stand there and monitor and, and you know, uh, do that, uh, monitor the system for you. Or even when the automobile came out, it had to be escorted by a human walking beside it. Um, and so, you know, with technology change, you do need to do this in a way that I think, we, we think about, you know, taking the public along with the journey for it. Um, there is real appetite from, uh, from consumers. You know, a recent study that came out last week showed that people want to have autonomous driving. They see it as the future. Everyone knows someone that's really tragically been hurt in a road accident. AI and self-driving can eliminate that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I, you know, I think the, the question is, how do you ensure that's brought out in a way that continues to earn trust and earn the right to operate? Mm. John, I know faculty is doing some really fascinating work with various bits of government, so the NHS, the MOD. Just give us a flavour of some of those practical um, applications of this technology that could actually help patients, children. We've heard a little bit about schools, but the armed forces. What kind of things do you think we're going to see over the next 10 years? Sure. Well, I mean, even starting with the kind of things we already see today, mm. um, AI is being used fairly widely across the public sector um, to drive efficiency um, improvements. So uh, just to name things that we're working on, so working with the government to use AI to um, detect uh, disinformation attacks by hostile state actors. Uh, we're working with the National Crime Agency to use AI to uh, really speed up the, the, the process they use to detect um, suspected child sexual offences uh, happening on the internet and sort of diverting resources to the, the people who need it the most and, and sort of um, hopefully getting to vulnerable children more quickly. Um, we worked with the uh, NHS across COVID to uh, design and, and run the early warning system that allowed uh, people sat in gold command every day to look right across the whole system um, to, to see hospital by hospital patient demand waves and then to make good decisions about how to allocate resources um, right across the system. So all the way across the public sector and, and more generally across the economy, um, exactly as Poppy said, the technology is basically used every day by people. Um, but nevertheless, the gap between how it is used and sort of what is possible um, is, is still just so big. Um, and so um, it feels to me that, again, you know, the, the big question for us all today is how do we drive adoption in the public sector and beyond? And what do you think are the next steps? Well, I think there needs to be... Um, speaking personally, not as faculty, but I think there needs to be an election um, to happen. Uh, and then I think we, there needs to be uh, just serious, um, serious leadership and focus on it. It's, I find it 
um, very inspiring that the sort of the angle of this um, entire event is about how technology can drive change because I think that is it is basically one of the one of the few shots we have as a nation to getting back on track. And I think that just needs to be serious questions asked about the, the, the sort of culture of, um, I guess, procurement and just the public service in general. Um, Patrick Valance talked earlier about how, had the vaccine program not achieved its objectives, the National Audit Office would be there to beat it with a stick. And, and the National Audit Office is important, it does good work, it makes sure that there's, uh, you know, there's value for money. But where's the National Audacity Office, whose job is to look across the public sector and push people on whether they're using technology on their being as sort of imaginative and innovative as, as they could be? There's just a massive imbalance in how this stuff plays out. But then the narrative is all about risk. So even this morning we had Christopher Nolan comparing the rise of AI to the atomic bomb with the sort of, because of the impact on humanity. Do you think that's right, Poppy, that the, the impact is going to be so huge and actually we don't quite know yet what the potential damage is going to be? We, we don't know. And we're seeing it, like for cybersecurity, we're seeing it leveraged in attacks in the ways I talked about, that, you know, they are unpredictable. But the opportunity is still overwhelmingly huge. When it comes to defending organizations, AI is one of the most singular powerful tools that allows businesses to get the front foot again in what otherwise would be a sort of AI versus AI, attacker versus defender. And if you're not equipped for that fight, you will always be on the back foot. So I do think it's essential that businesses do operate it. I think the sort of theme that's coming through is, is about how do we as as consumers, as members of society, really embrace this technology and learn to trust it. And just with self-driving cars, it is a journey. It is, it is having a go and experiencing these things and understanding what the opportunities are, where the limitations are. And tools like ChatGPT are fantastic ways in which we just get to have a go. And I would always encourage anything that is consumer-facing in this way for people to experience it for themselves. And I suspect what we'll see is that the wave that follows in the enterprise will shortly follow this. I feel like this is a big wave of consumer understanding about AI and it's what it can be afforded. And I think over the next 12 months, we'll see that cascade into enterprises as we really see businesses or governments sort of really adopt AI because we as individuals have a much better understanding of what it can do and, and, and what the opportunities are. Mm. And Alex, do you worry, how do we make sure that the humans ultimately stay in charge? Is there a danger of the machines taking over? I, I, I think that danger is far out from where we are today. The practical reality of the systems we build today is that they are, you know, they're designed and controlled in a, in a fairly closed environment. Um, in particular, uh, they're, they're designed in a way where, uh, to take autonomous driving as an example, where we are looking to align them with what, what people would find trusted and safe. Um, even if you look at uh, these systems, they operate within a, um, with a, within a set of bounds that you can um, test and prove is, is safe. So I think as long as we see um, you know, the economic opportunity matched with the prosperity of these systems um, and, uh, and I think the appropriate regulation and environment that, ke that keeps that going longer term, I th I, I'm optimistic about the benefit that these technologies will bring. Mm. Um, uh, even, you know, at the point where we have fleets of autonomous vehicles operating around, uh, ar 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 around our cities, um, the way that we're thinking about as an industry and the way that the technology is deployed in a responsible way, whether it's the cyber security on these vehicles themselves, whether it's the fail safe and the ability for them to understand what they do know, but also what they don't know. And when there might be scenarios that are unexpected or where they do need human assistance, all of these mechanisms are being put in place in a very thoughtful manner in a way where the industry uh, is peer reviewing uh, and ensuring that they're, they're going to be deployed responsibly. And I'm, I'm sure many other industries have parallels to that, like autonomous driving. Uh, so I have reasons to feel optimistic. And John, do you think in terms of the public services that the public is persuadable uh, about the case for data being handed over, which is obviously key to the whole thing? And Patrick Balance, I thought, was very interesting, saying we well, yeah, just have to be more grown up about it. Are we constantly handing our data to Facebook or Amazon or whatever. Do you think that that's an argument that can be won or almost on consumer grounds that it's going to be more convenient for you to have a medical card where the doctors can all read your records? I think so. And I, I, I think part of that is about making sure that 
we're clear with the public about the, the benefits that they get from um, the application of this technology. It means better, more proactive, more personalized public services, um, and it also means cheaper public services because the technology can reduce costs a lot. Um, and so there's actually some quite um, sort of good research that was done by a bunch of um, NHS trusts in northwest London fairly recently. So they, they wanted to make sure that they were able to use patient data um, as um, sort of widely as they were able to. So they ran a bunch of citizen juries um, with members of the public and they just talked to them about um, what data they wanted to use and what they wanted to use it for. Um, and so, A, as a mechanism for building public trust, that just feels like a very good idea, very wise, and, and I think well worth replicating. But B, more interestingly, when they actually talked to the public about this, in general, the public said, why aren't you already using this data? We kind of assumed we're using it for this stuff anyway. And they were way more permissive in what they expected, that, in what they wanted the data to be used for, than most of the information governance processes that, that, that restrict it. So I actually think the argument is there to be won. It just needs to be had properly. Mm. Poppy, I'm really interested in your take on the China question, whether you think that they should be included in the summit that the government's planning. Um, do you need to have a kind of completely global agreement in order to make this, these systems completely safe, or is the threat too great? I think, bear in mind that the organisations that we're perhaps helping def businesses defend themselves against is not, it's not always these nation states. Mm. And every nation has very sophisticated cyber offensive capabilities. And we see geopolitics being played out in digital businesses all the time. But the reality is the big at scale bad actors in this tends to be you're just organized criminal gangs are operating like big businesses on the other side of the dark web that can operate at scale and these are big businesses so they've got they've got graphics departments they've got marketing departments they've got a payroll team these are big organizations and those are the people that will not be responding to a regulation they don't care whether they're doing it is compliant or not they're going to be using that technology to best effect wherever they can in order to make the fastest amount of money that they possibly can so i wholeheartedly agree that we need to think carefully about regulation but it's got to be something that doesn't prevent us as the defenders of this to not be able to keep up with the pace of technology innovation that the attackers are able to to embrace but would you agree with Patrick Vance that there's no point having some kind of agreement that doesn't include China? Uh, I, I, I couldn't say one way or the other. I think what is necessary is a good, healthy debate and having another frame of reference about what China thinks of those guardrails and compared to what we perhaps would think of our good guardrails, I think that is a good, healthy discussion. I think both sides should be paying close attention to what the others are up to.